For Andrew Jackson, the central question of his presidency was what he could do to prevent these average Americans from being exploited by the rich and powerful. The answer Jackson hit upon was to destroy an institution that he thought was giving the wealthy an unfair advantage. Its real title was the Second Bank of the United States, but Jackson's supporters called it the Monster Bank. Andrew Jackson dislikes all banks, he said at one point, but he particularly disliked the Bank of the United States as established by Congress after the War of 1812. The reason was simple. It had too much power outside of any kind of public accountability. The bank was an enormous economic institution. It could really control credit and therefore control the American economy itself. For Jackson, that meant that the American economy was being run by people who were not elected, that these unelected bankers had their hands on the levers of power and could control people's lives, their destinies, and indeed could control the political system itself. To Jackson, one of the Monster Bank's worst sins was that it was funding new style businesses that were beginning to wrap their tentacles around both the economy and the government. These new businesses were called corporations. The problem with corporations, as far as Jackson was concerned, was they had no body to be kicked or soul to be damned. They were um, faceless, anonymous machines that were motivated only by making profit for their shareholders. And as a result, they could grow much, much larger than the average consumer, the average worker, the average citizen. But Jackson's opponents thought corporations would help America become more prosperous. And they thought his plan to blow up the bank verged on insanity. For it was the bank that guaranteed that the paper dollars in Americans' wallets were worth something. Jackson took a kind of fundamentalist view of money and credit. Gold and silver dollars were real money. Paper was, in some sense, fake. Those who were perhaps more astute economists than Jackson thought that this position was just short of Neanderthal. The United States had been built on credit. As Henry Clay said in the Senate, we have always been a paper money people. We won the revolution on paper money. Clay and his allies in Congress decided to put some heat on old hickory. Near the end of Jackson's first term, they passed a bill extending the bank's charter. Clay calculated that the president would have no choice but to sign the bill because a veto would be seen by the American public as so irresponsible it would cost Jackson re-election. But Andrew Jackson also changed our banking system. Just as today, banks were very important to the industrial and mercantile development of the U.S. And at the beginning of Jackson's presidency, American banking was dominated by the Second National Bank, which you'll remember had been established by Congress as part of the American system. So in 1832, bank leader Nicholas Biddle persuaded Congress to pass a bill extending the life of the second U.S. bank for 20 years. Jackson thought that the bank would use its money to oppose his re-election in 1836, so he vetoed that bill. In fact, the reason I knew that was from the veto message is because it talks about the bank as an instrument to subvert democracy. Jackson set himself up as a defender of the lower classes by vetoing the bank's charter. Now, Whigs took exception to the idea that the president was somehow a more democratic representative of the people than the legislature. But in the end, Jackson's view won out. He used the veto power more than any prior president, turning it into a powerful tool of policy. Which it remains to this day, by the way. So the Second Bank of the U.S. expired in 1836, which meant that suddenly we had no central institution with which to control federal funds. Jackson ordered that money should be dispersed into local banks, unsurprisingly preferencing ones that were friendly to him. These so-called pet banks were another version of rewarding political supporters that Jackson liked to call rotation in office. 
Opponents called this tactic of awarding government offices to political favorites the spoils system. Anyway, these smaller banks proceeded to print more and more paper money because, you know, free money. Like between 1833 and 1837, the face value of banknotes in circulation rose from $10 million to $149 million, and that meant inflation. Initially, states loved all this new money that they could use to finance internal improvements, but inflation is really bad for wage workers and also eventually everyone. So all this out-of-control inflation, coupled with rampant and land speculation eventually led to an economic collapse, the Panic of 1837. The subsequent depression lasted until 1843, and Jackson's bank policy proved to be arguably the most disastrous fiscal policy in American history, which is really saying something. It also had a major effect on American politics because business-oriented Democrats became Whigs and the remaining Democrats further aligned with agrarian interests, which meant slavery.